The title of this message is, If My People Pray. You can see the poster over there. I know we've used that scripture before, uh, 2 Chronicles. If my people pray and turn, God will heal the nation. Now that, of course, was written about Israel and Judah. But let's apply the principle to America, Canada, and maybe a few other nations could throw in that bunch. But especially America, because um, America is still the bulwark. It has been for quite a while. You know, De Tocqueville came. Interesting, Alex de Tocqueville came to America in 1830s, you know, French philosopher. He said America is great because the American people have high moral standards. That's, I'm summarizing it. But that's pretty much what he said. We are relative to the, I realize this is relative to the rest of the world. So remember I'm saying relative to the rest of the world, America has been the major non-Catholic Christian power, the first country to ever give religious freedom. I can elaborate, you get the general point. Okay, so, um, and God says if you will pray and seek my face and turn from your wicked ways. So what should we, the Church of God pray about. Here's, here's what I'm proposing. Um, if there's any chance in delaying the fall of America, or America has to at least descend to open the way for the Holy Roman Empire and all the end time prophecies. Well, um, you know, God is somewhat event driven. If America could make uh, somewhat of a turn, God could delay that many years. Or we could have a soft landing, let's say from economic and leadership crisis. You know, you could have a hard landing where things just explode. You can have a soft landing where things start bad, but not so bad. In other words, America could still be blessed in the context we're in now. And my answer would be, the answer is yes, it could go better than some of us might expect. Therefore, could you and I have an impact on that soft landing or America staying up there longer as a guide to freedom? Because most people in the world, and you see what's happening on our border, now I realize that some of that's perverse, and, but you, you almost, I think it's like over 100 and some nations and they, if they're given a chance to come to America, they pay the, the drug cartels, well, that's, I'm told, thousands of dollars. Yeah, we want to come to America. That's where you have freedom and prosperity. Now, I know you think, well, it's starting to end as things start to go down. Well, maybe we can keep it up there longer and better. And who knows? Maybe a lot better. And, and that impact is for our prayers. Um, and um, there are a lot of things that we could say about Israel. Uh, I just want to mention one thing. If you look at the history of the northern ten, Israel, and the southern three tribes, Judah, all of them eventually made stupid political mistakes that ended in their ruin. They counted on Egypt, and it was a disaster. It's almost as if God says, if you forsake me, and go into idolatry and lose knowledge and focus on the true God. I'll let you do stupid things and fall into political and economic disaster. And you'll see that clearly when you look at the history of the northern ten Israel. Judah lasted longer because they did have some better leaders and they did have some revivals. But I want to start in Isaiah 31.1. And, and this is just a warning to them. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses, who trust in chariots. They were like the tanks of their day, or fighter jets, because they're many, because they are very strong, but who do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek Jehovah. In other words, when a nation turns its view from saying, we're relying on our, our political alliances, 
that you trust the guys in the State Department to do that right? <laughs> what a joke. Anyway, <clears throat> and we're going to rely on military power. You realize that's, that is just asking for disaster? Military power, I know I've said this before, but beginning of World War II, Japan had the best fighter jet in the world. And probably the most dedicated, and I mean radically dedicated soldiers. It doesn't guarantee you victory. God gives you victory. And um, you could talk about a lot of other things, but you get the general idea. America has got to learn to rely on, on more being a moral country. And in most of America's wars, actually, it was, it, it was the militia, just regular farmers and you know, whatever you call it, who turned out at the last minute uh, well, a bunch of them were at Yorktown for the victory over the British, but my point is, it wasn't, I'm not knocking professional armies, but I'm just saying, it's God you have to rely on. And uh, many of those men were Bible believers. You know, two-thirds of the Congress that, you know, that revolted against Great Britain, two-thirds of the representatives were clerics, Protestant ministers. And that, did, that didn't mean the rest of them didn't believe in God either. They all did. Some were more church-oriented than others, but you get the general idea. What America needs is more thoughts about God and morality. And I'm going to give an opinion, but I believe it's true. Our courts and our lawmakers have undermined marriage. I mean, they've made marriage undefined, almost a joke, and where young men say, well, wait a minute, I can get what, what I want without getting married, and getting married ties me down legally, and uh, why bother? It doesn't matter, it doesn't mean anything. And now, by the way, I'm not saying that's the right perspective, but I'm, can you see that our courts have done that to America? And, they're gonna, and it's gonna get worse. They're now talking about group marriages, could be, uh, two men and four women. And I'm making this up. I heard it on the radio. They, and they say, oh, the courts would approve it. The stuff they've already done, they might as well, why not do that too? So that marriage means nothing. Um, that's not godly. That's a bad direction. Um, <clears throat> in our prayers, we need to be sincere and honest with God. Because God, the whole point of prayer is our development. We want to be friends of God. For instance, if you hate your enemy, but you know the, what, what, what Christ said about love your enemy. So you get into a prayer and you say, oh, God, bless bad Bob who works in the shop with me, but I really hate his guts. And you, you, that's what you're thinking. And I've been sincere. God knows you're not sincere. I would say it's probably better to say, God, you know how I feel about bad Bob and he probably deserves his comeuppance, but you want me to learn to love everybody, so I'm going to ask you to bless him in spite of it and help him learn to be and for us to get along. And by the way, when God tells us to pray for enemies, is he concerned about our enemies? He's concerned about us, our heart. So prayer is about us primarily, foremost. I want to mention Abraham. When when God and the three angels were leaving dinner with Abraham, going to Sodom and Gomorrah, they said, well, Abraham's our friend. We should tell him what we're about to do. Because they knew that his favorite nephew, Lot, lived there and uh, wasn't too far away. And so they told Abraham. And Abraham negotiated with God as a friend. You know, he said, he said don't be angry, God, but uh, you wouldn't want to kill the good and the bad in Sodom and Gomorrah, would you? What if there are 50 good families there, led by 50 good men, however he would have worded it, and God says, okay, no. And then he negotiated him down to 40, down to 20, 30, to 10. And God said, okay. Well, you know what happened. <laughs> the angels got there. They couldn't even find 10 good families in Sodom. But they did do what Abraham was most concerned about rescue Lot. Now, Lot couldn't bring all his family with him because they were too enmeshed in it. Um, by the way, do you see a similar trend in America? One guy said, 
If God is happy with America, he'd have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, I'm shocked any of you, but, but I do think we could turn the other direction, right? We should, that's what we should pray about. I'm going back into Isaiah 37. And this is another story, but it's somewhat similar. Isaiah 37, another story, somewhat similar. <clears throat> this is about Hezekiah. And um, let me describe the situation. The, uh, the Assyrian Empire starts with A. The Assyrian Empire was the big bully from the north, uh, dominating the world. They had taken the uh, 10 northern tribes into captivity. And, you know, a decade later, so let's go back and take Judah as well. But Judah had a reasonably good king, Hezekiah. So when they got there, they had other pressures which we won't go into now. They wanted a quick surrender. They didn't want a long, hard siege. So when they surrounded Jerusalem, they had guys, and they spoke in Hebrew so the people on the wall could hear. They said, you're going to starve and you're going to suffer. If you surrender to the kind king of Assyria, it will give you good land. You know, we call it war propaganda to get them to surrender. But then here's the big mistake they made. And don't let your king convince you that your God uh, <clears throat> can save you. Because where were the gods of Arapath? He rattled off about eight other city-states that they had conquered on their way down there. And they all had their gods. Could their gods stand up to the great military machine that's Assyria? Of course not. And your God, Jehovah, is going to be just like one of the rest of them. And besides, he told me, you know, I won't go into all their propaganda, but in other words, they offended God. But what's, and I'm going to read uh, Isaiah 37, 21. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord God, because you prayed to me. And I'm going to stop there, and then we can get to the other verses in a minute. God was not going to do anything about the Assyrians until the king prayed to God. In other words, sometimes God does not act until the people he's working with ask him to act. And you're going to say, what sense does that make? To me, I'm giving that what seems logical. Uh, let's say if your kid is being persecuted in public school, um, God knows it. You know, God has sources, whatever, how he does with all his angels and all kinds of things. He knows everything. He knows probably your kid's problem even better than you do before you even ask. But he probably is not going to intervene until you ask in prayer. And you could ask a lot of other problems as well. Why? Because what's important to God is you, your heart, your spirit. Not saving this world now. I mean, in other words, there's all kinds of sickness in the world. I could rattle off all. It, 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 I'm not saying God doesn't care, but God is not saving the world now. Since he's not saving the world now, he's concerned with us. So you need to pray and ask God to intervene, and then he will act because he wants to build a relationship between you and him. And, and also, it gives us the dignity of being part of God's plan and part of God's solution. Think about it. Like if the White House called you and they said, we want your advice on how to solve the border problem, whatever it is, and you'd, you'd be honored that somebody offered you a chance to be part of the solution. That's what God is doing through prayer. Uh, so Hezekiah had to ask. Um, <clears throat> and um, um, so what Hezekiah did was after they did the announcement actually the king of Assyria actually sent a letter to Hezekiah with some similar statements so Hezekiah went to the temple uh, and he prayed and actually Things in the letter that were offensive to God, he pointed out to God in the prayer. Um, and then God sent Isaiah the prophet to him with the answer. Um, and I'm going to read it. This, this is the rest of what I was reading before. 22 
this is the word which Jehovah has spoken concerning him, meaning the king of Assyria. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head behind your back. Whom have you reproached and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted up your eyes on high? Then he basically says, we're going to cut you down in a more poetic way. And, and what happened was, when the king joined his 185,000 soldiers besieging Jerusalem, they were all dead. The way it appears, where it's written up is, they went to bed one night and God just turned them off. They were just, they went to every tent. Every man was dead. All those tough, brave soldiers were dead. God just turned them off. And then, of course, the king said, his bodyguard ran back to Nineveh where he was assassinated, probably in part for his whole army being destroyed. But at least that was initiated by the prayer of the king of Judah, Hezekiah. And then Isaiah, you know, as the conduit, gave him the answer to that prayer. Well, what about arrogant secularists in our world? Now, I'm not saying they're as bad as, things aren't as clear cut as they were in ancient days, but aren't there a lot of secularists in politics today and in academia who do not believe in the Bible, who do not believe in God, who do not believe in principles, who do not believe in the Ten Commandments, who don't believe in much of anything except the wisdom of man, which changes, you know, one thing is fashionable, a few years later something else. Well, we can, we can approach God in prayer and say, well, God, you see what's going on. Do you really want to reward these people who do not believe in you, who are doing things the opposite of your laws and your ways. And our prayers might persuade God. I mean, God knows it. I'm not saying he doesn't know it. But persuade him to act, to do things that turn this nation in a better direction. And I know at this point, you look at, well, look at what I call the secularists, the, the, the people that do not believe in God. They may be agnostic, or some of them have a very, very liberal religion, a religion where they deny that, um, some of them even deny that Christ was God or that he was resurrected or certain miracles, you know, or there's a literal second coming of Christ. They deny that. But you know what I mean when I call it the Christian left. They're kind of in on that kind of watered down thing. Those people don't believe. And you could say, well, God, look, do we really want to reward them for that kind of behavior and ask God, challenge God. Uh, you read the prayers of David and Moses, they challenge God. I mean, they were bold. I'm not saying they weren't respectful, but they were bold in their prayer. We should be bold in our prayer. Tell God what we really think. I mean, obviously, whatever God does, he does, and we can't force God to do anything, but be bold in our prayers. Um, and many of these people, they believe in politics and power and, you know, and, and leverage. We got all these DAs. We can do anything we want. Um, so I know our world is more complex than it was in the Bible days. It's harder to see things. Um, but remember, God knows the problem better than we do. It's not a question of telling God anything. It's a question of persuading God to do, to see who's on one side and who's on the other side. Uh, we want it, God is giving us the honor, the dignity of being part of the solution, part of the input to God, whatever he does decide. Um, so what are, what are God's concerns when it comes to our prayer life? Uh, what is he really concerned about? He wants to build in us faith, and trust in him. So ask, he wants us to ask him before he moves. That's why the king had to first, because you know, God could have struck down those um, Assyrians immediately, but he waited till the king put it in front of God's nose, you might say. Look at what these arrogant people have said. Um, 
The king had to ask God. We have to ask God. Then God acts. Because God wants to develop in us a relationship between him and us. Like people going through a crisis and they deal with each other through the crisis and at the end they have a much stronger relationship and they understand each other. In part, that's what we're experiencing now. Isaiah 37, 20. Now therefore, O Lord, our God, this is the end of his prayer, save us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, Jehovah, alone are God. And, and, and of course, uh, be nice if we could pray something so the world will know, yeah, praying to God is not a bad thing to do. And uh, I know they, they lump the religious right with crazy Nazis and uh, Hope some of you saw the article in the Buffalo Gap. That's uh, conservatism and Nazism, two opposite things totally, but the world has that lie going. Well, actually, I know it's odd. The Nazis and the communists were both socialists because it's National Socialist Party. It's just there were different varieties of it, and they were mortal rivals. Sometimes people in the same industry can be mortal rivals, if you think of that politically. Uh, the Red Guard and and Mussolini's black shirts um, and Hitler's brown shirts fought in the streets and the cities of Europe with the communists they had the red scarves and the red shirts and well my point is true Bible believing conservatives are getting a bad name from a media that's less than honest we all know that by now right by the way all the latest revelations about the Biden crime family and all their offshore shell corporations. By the way, you don't have shell corporations to transfer money around unless you're hiding something illegal. Why would you do The media, the mainstream media hasn't touched that story with a 10-foot pole. Too many facts, too true. So you all know the media can't be trusted. You know academia is way off base. You know that Hollywood can't be trusted uh, and, and other and to some extent, academia affects the legal profession. They're all kind of going off the secular deep end. We all can see that. Um, so pray to God not to let them get away with discounting the power of prayer. James 5.16. James 5.16. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Whenever I heard that for the first time, I said, righteous, who, me? And isn't that what we all think? Well, but the truth is, when God looks at us, at least if we're sincere and reasonably trying, he sees the covering of Jesus Christ's sacrifice, which blocks out our sin, or the record of our sin, like it's blotted out. So we are righteous before God because of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that you're allowed to run wild and Jesus will it's okay with God, but you know what I mean. So when we pray, we can have power. That's what James was telling the people. Elijah was a man of a nature like ours. Now we think of Elijah, well he was a great arch archetype prophet. And we're just regular people. But he's saying Elijah was a man. A lot of people described Elijah from the description as a guy who was rough, tough, and hairy strong and blunt few words and that probably is what Elijah was like um, like one king sent some people to go to uh, the Lord of the flies kind of the God of the dead about his sick using the sick bed and he sent the reps and and they turned around and came back with their arms. he said how, how come you're back so soon well, we met this guy on the road and he told us that there's, there's no God in Israel. You have to go to the, this pagan God for healing, and you're going to die. He said, what did the guy look like? And they, they described this rough, tough guy who was blunt. He said, oh, that's Elijah, all right. And he did die in his deathbed, of course. Elijah was right. God was backing Elijah up. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain for three and a half years. And he said, you will not get another drop of rain until I pray for it. 
Now, what we don't know is, did God tell him to do that? Or did he decide to pull the nation back to God, or uh, at least the last attempt to do so? Maybe he persuaded God, and God didn't persuade him. The way it's written up, it was Elijah's idea. God backed him up all the way. Um, and I think it did make some difference in that nation's history. At least Ahab repented somewhat. We can go into that a little bit later. But, um, and then he prayed again, and the heaven gave its rain. And then he says in verse 19, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone turns him back, verse 20 of James 5, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. What he's saying is if you see one of your fellow brothers about to leave the faith, he's going off the deep end into apostasy or, or I want to go back into the world because I want to be popular with so-and-so and whatever. And there's a lot of, and by the way, you know, if you look, I, I'm old enough to remember when they came up with the sexual revolution in the 1960s. And just from a human point of view, uh, we won't go into all the Woodstock stuff, but you, some of you know what I mean. When you say uh, free sex and everything, uh, and free drugs, doesn't that sound like a ton of fun and wonderful, right? It turned out to be bad for society, really bad. I could, but you don't want to hear all the stats, but you know what I mean. Uh, things have to be used responsibly. So if you see someone saying, well, the worldly stuff seems like so much fun. Yes, it's fun at first, but there are side effects and deadly consequences. And people who can avoid those things in their life are blessed. And that's really true. And you see somebody about to go off the deep end or go off with some renegade, preacher with some weird, whatever, if you can pray for him and encourage him, you might be able to save him, and God will really bless you a great deal for it. In other words, you see the guy that's going off, and you pray for him, and you go, well, why would God, can't God save him without your praying for him? Obviously, God can do anything he wants, and I don't want to try to see how I'm limiting God, but why might your prayer make a difference? Because... If you pray for a bad Bob who's going off the deep end, you'll learn concern for bad Bob. You'll learn to love even people that aren't so lovable. Isn't that what God wants to be inside us, right? Well, you might ask yourself in that same section of the book, what about if someone um, has problems or sick and you say, well, let's get as many brethren to pray for that person as possible and it'll have more effect with God. Well, why would that be true? If you just pray for yourself, why isn't that enough? And I'm not saying praying for yourself might not be enough, but why is it more powerful to get other people? Because it binds people together. If you pray for somebody, you you learn to be concerned for them. Hopefully over time you might, in spite, they may not have the great personality that you like, you might still love them anyway. Can you see God is using prayer to help build us? And hopefully it will persuade God to intervene. Um, but it's, it's a good thing. Okay, I want to tell another corny story to kind of make a point. You know, you know I, <clears throat> if you're trying to be funny, you all have to know when to laugh. So just be alert and you'll, you'll get it. Okay, now. Um, this guy drives into a gully, just wasn't paying attention off the edge of the road, and luckily a farmer comes along with a big powerful horse, uh, and, he's, and so he hitches the horse up to his car. By the way, horses have a lot of pulling power, you know, uh, anyway, I've seen some stories. He hitches the horse up, and he says, um, his mule is Buddy, and Buddy will pull him out. Boy, he says, pull, Nellie, pull. Nothing happens. Pull, Coco, pull. You know. <clears throat> pull, Wendy, pull. Nothing happens. And then he says, pull, buddy, pull. And he pulls him out of the ditch. You know, why did you have to call your horse by other names before he reacted? He says, well, uh, buddy is blind, and he's not doing anything by himself.
If others aren't going to pour with him, he's not doing anything by himself. He's not even going to try. Um, I do think I just want to show that so that a group of people praying can have power. And, you know, try to get a few of your uh, brethren to pray for you, pray with you. As James says, tell them your concerns. Now, you may not want to tell them all your deep, dark secrets and start any bad gossip, but tell them your concerns and problems, and, and the group prayer will have power. That's what James is saying. Um, we need to love each other, and prayer allows us to do that. And God allowed King Hezekiah to be the solution to those 185 soldiers that got turned off just like that. Uh, they were dead. Just nothing happened to them. No great plague. They just were suddenly dead. Um, can we give America a soft landing or more time and freedom? Because America is still the number one place for religious freedom. And if religious freedom goes here, you know, they don't have it in the, there's a family that left Germany because they wanted to homeschool the kids. They didn't like things being taught in the public school system in Germany. And they're, they're I, I gotta qualify my answer. Germany is still somewhat socialistic. I, I'm not saying they're not a capitalist country as well. They're both, but um, they, they actually want all the people doing what they're told, marching to, you know, everybody goes to public school and you know, whatever they, the government wants you to learn. They don't allow homeschooling. And they also didn't like this guy's religious attitudes. He was too independent thinking. So I said, well, I'll go to America. That's the land of religious freedom. And ups and down. And 15 years later, he's been here. All of a sudden, the Biden administration is sending him back where they'll either put him in jail and or take his kids away, or both. Now, I think he's going to try to find a third nation secretly to go to, but we'll see how that works out. The point I'm making is America has always been the land of religious freedom. Maybe that's what God is most concerned about. Maybe that's why we didn't get involved in World War I at the first three horrible years of it. And also for other reasons too, but um, but we shall see what will happen. But can you see religious freedom is slowly being threatened? Do you see that? Now, uh, granted, it's only starting at certain places and certain people. And like one guy said, as long as they're coming for somebody else, I don't care. But if they come for so-and-so, and then for somebody here, and then somebody there, they may someday come for us, take our religious freedom. You think, oh, no, they, the liberals wouldn't do that. Yes, they would. If they get the chance. My only point is um, pray that they don't have the power to do it, at least not for many years. Isaiah 37, 35. For I will defend this city and save it for, for my own sake my sir, and David's sake. He did it for David's sake. That's how much God loved David. And David had some great bold prayers with God. And, uh, and tell God what you think. We're still, relatively speaking, the most Bible-oriented country in the world. I know that's hard to believe, but it's still true. You think, well, what about Great Britain? And I get rattled right off others. No, uh, church attendance is bad. They don't, I'm often going to running them down. My only point is, this is a country known for religious freedom and free speech, and even free speech is they're chipping away at that too, as they prosecute certain people for saying things that, including our former president, that they don't agree with. And, uh, you know, if you get a biased jury and a biased judge, you can do anything. Didn't the O.J. Simpson trial prove that? If you don't agree with me, you can tell me later. <laughs> but you kind of know what I mean, right? Um, um, and um, let's look at Moses' example. In Moses' case, um, 10 times the Israelites had offended God, and, and then they wouldn't go into the promised land. God said, this is it. These people are really bad. I'm just tired of it. Uh, they failed 10 tests. Told Moses, I'm going to end all these people and start over with just 
Moses and your family. And Moses, of course, taught God out of it. Moses was bold in prayer. Exodus 32, 11. Exodus 32, 11. And Moses besought the Lord, thy wrath waxes hot against your people. Didn't, you know, it was, it was God's people, that's the way Moses put it. That you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Verse 12. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains? Turn from your fierce wrath. And then he asked God to do it for God's reputation. For God's reputation. Not for the goodness of the people. I thought that's most interesting. Moses did not say, well, most of the people are good. They're just some rabble-rousers. Or there's a heavy percentage of really wonderful people. Uh, Moses couldn't back that up because, you know, God could lift up the, in a tents, the roofs of all the tents and see what the people really like. And there weren't, apparently there weren't that many really um, godly people in there. So he didn't, he didn't base it saving Israel on their goodness. He based it on his prayer on God's goodness, on God's reputation. So if we were to approach God in the current situation, we'd say, God, look, your Bible is being downplayed. The word of God is being dismissed. We could elaborate a little bit. For the sake of your reputation and your word, you should intervene to pull things back in a better direction. Verse 13, and this is what Abraham prayed. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and said unto them, I will multiply your seed. So in other words, he says, God, you gotta remember your promise that you made to Abraham and his descendants. Technically, God could have done it through Moses, but it wouldn't have been quite the same. So he's basing his prayer on God's reputation the certainty of God's promises. He motivates God, and Moses did, by looking at God's goodness. Uh, so think about that also in our prayers. Let's look at David's example. God never intended to build a temple. He just had a little portable thing, and then through wars with the um, Philistines, actually the ark got separated from the tabernacle. It wasn't really functioning anymore. Um, um, you realize that when David made that prayer, he said how God had blessed him, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, and your, and your tabernacle sitting over there in the corner in this little tent, uh, kind of by itself, and that represents your, you know, your crown or your throne room. He says, look, I want to build a mighty, beautiful, gorgeous temple. You deserve it. And God said to David, um, because you're a man of bloody war, and that's, of course, the role that God gave David, so he's not blaming David. He's just saying that um, I'll let your son do it, but I'm going to do it because you ask. And then he said one more thing, David said, you wanted to build a house for me, I will build a house for you. Your dynasty will last. And we might, people might laugh at this, but you look at the British throne. It's the only major throne that survived the 20th century. All the others, you can rattle them off, either they went into obscurity or they were murdered. I, you, you know, I'm going, but you know, like what happened to, uh, well, quite a few, maybe the most dramatic one is the Tsar of Russia, but um, it, same thing to the Kaiser. All those words mean Caesar, by the way, in different languages. All those thrones die. But in the 1920s and 30s, when others were being eliminated, killed, or run out of power, the British throne gained in popularity. How do you like that? And there was the King of England that put Winston Churchill in charge during the dark days of World War II and won the war. And I guarantee you, if Prince William, who's the crown prince, or his dad, uh, King Charles came to New York City or St. Louis or Kansas City, it would be a big deal. You, you know what I mean. Even some of their second stringers like uh, Meghan Markle and Harry, they get a lot of media attention. In other words, and by the way, the people in Britain say that. My wife and I visited, I think it was Westminster Abbey, we got a taste to a tour of England, and we saw the old throne 
that they crowned people on, supposedly for centuries back in Scotland and Ireland. And they had underneath it a stone. They said it was Jacob's stone. And they believed that they were, that that throne was the David's throne. Now, I realize people criticize that. Oh, that's trying to make the British more important than they are. Well, it does fit the Bible, though, doesn't it? Now, I'm saying this about David. Do you realize that the Temple Mount is one of the most crucial places in world politics in the world? And why is it there? Because of David's prayer. And it will be a crucial touch point in the end time events. And I know it looks like it's not going to happen now because Israel is very secular and divided, but it's on Netanyahu's wish list. They never know what may happen. He's back in power, but I, I concede it doesn't look likely. But you never know how it will work itself out. But the day it does, you know the end is, we're on the countdown to the return of Christ. I mean the day that they desecrate the temple. But I'm going to say that accurately. But the day they build it, we're getting closer to that point in time. And that whole thing, the Dome of the Rock is there because Islam inspired by you know who wanted to put their mark on the sacred mountain of God where the temple was. You all know that, don't you? All that is because of David's prayer. He altered history. David did. 2 Samuel 2, 7, 6. For I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt, even to this day, but have moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about with all the children of Israel, have I ever spoken any word to anyone of the tribes of Israel about building him a temple? And then he goes on to say, you were just, you know, a young boy, maybe teenager, 16, 17, shepherding um, sheep. You know, and God says, I've never said to anybody, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Verse 8, now therefore, thus shall I say to my servant David, thus shall the Lord say, and then he goes on to say how he's going to bless David. But that temple is one of the biggest things in history. It exists only because of the prayer of King David. That's the power of prayer to someone that's bold and a friend of God. King David changed the history of the world to that extent. <clears throat> I want to mention Samuel's example. The people of Israel said, we want a king. We want to be like all the other nations. You know, big standing army, big king, and central government. And Samuel uh, said that was a bad political choice, but God would allow it. 1 Samuel 12, 23. Here's what Samuel said, uh, because when he told them it's going to be bad news, they were kind of worried about it. And Samuel said to them, 1 Samuel 12, 23, Moreover, as for me, Far be it from me, that is Samuel the prophet, that I should sin against Jehovah in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. So I want to just throw this statement out. Could that apply to us? In other words, even if America is making bad choices, things that we know are not right, would it be sinful for us not to pray? You see, that's what he told Samuel. And Samuel said, you know, I'm going to pray for you all that it works out as well as it can in spite of what's happening. So I think using that scripture as a final scripture, we should pray that boldly that God will pull America back in a better direction. I know we'll never go back to being, you know, like it was in uh, Alec D. Tocqueville's day when, you know, he said, you know, the, you know, for the most part, American people were very good compared to the rest of the world. I, but pull America back a fair amount. Anything is possible if we are bold in our prayers.